tries again. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the live stream. If you're watching live, thank you so much for being here. If you're watching the archive, that's great, too. We're going to get rolling in a second. We've kind of a weird start because YouTube has changed around their live streaming stuff. But I think, we're, I think we got it now. So hi, everybody. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about five tips for learning to play the cello later in life as an adult. Really, it's technically these tips could apply to any age, but I'm sort of talking about an adult, beginner, someone starting out, you know, a less traditional, um, less traditional way of learning the instrument where we typically think of learning instruments from a young age with private lessons. Uh, this is kind of geared more towards people who are learning later on and they're maybe not a professional musician or maybe they played another instrument but just casually so here we go hi randy okay it looks like we finally got the stream going it was a little bit of a bumpy start because i don't even know if this was live when i said this or not but youtube has changed around some of the live streaming stuff so anyway here we are hi everybody um thanks for being here if you've already checked out my cello school thank you so much for doing that i'm super excited to talk about it today um, but we're really going to start out with these tips on learning to play the cello. We'll go through them pretty fast. Um, and then we will talk all about my new course. So hi, everybody. Hey, Joanna. Thanks for being here. Okay. So I think, think we're good now. I definitely got a little spooked by some of these changes that YouTube did, but I think we're good. So let's get into this. Um, I've obviously have lots of updates and things to tell you guys, but I'm going to do that after the content of this video for the people who are watching it after and just want to know the information. So let's talk about learning the cello uh, or learning any instrument really. But the reason I make it about the cello, besides the fact that that's what I do here on this channel, is that string instruments in particular are very technical and difficult to learn and slow in the beginning and require a lot of technique. So they can be more difficult to learn later in life than something like the piano. And I don't want to make it sound like any instrument is easy to learn, especially later in life. Um, but it's absolutely possible. And that's something I really do love to talk about. Um, watching from the Netherlands. Nice. I appreciate you. your late night watching, or at least much, much later than here in Los Angeles. Um, okay. So some tips on learning the cello and, uh, as always, when I do these live, you guys can always ask questions if it's relevant to the stuff that I'm talking about. I try to check in with the chat as much as I can. Um, so we'll go over some of these tips and then we will get into the announcements. So my first tip for of my five tips for learning the cello, the very first one is be patient. Now, a lot of times when we're attracted to learning an instrument, we're of course hearing professional recordings and you know, fantastic players with amazing tone and flawless technique. And we hear that and we think, oh, I want to play this instrument. I want to learn. I want to sound like that, which is great. Um, but we often don't know how slow things are in the beginning and how long it takes just to kind of get set up on the instrument before we can even really start thinking about major works or major pieces of music, like maybe some of your gold pieces, for example are not going to be necessarily attainable right away. It's going to take some time just to get acquainted on a new instrument. So patience is really important because I think it's kind of no way to know what something's going to be like until you do it, right? So I think most people underestimate um, the speed at which you can learn a new instrument. But I will say the slowest time of learning it is the very beginning. That's where your muscles have, they're not acquainted at all uh, with how to play on the instrument. So muscle memory, which is such a big factor of playing an instrument, has to be trained from nothing to something. So getting your muscles just used to the basic formations that you have to do on an instrument is very slow in the beginning because it's a completely new movement for your, your hands, your fingers, your arms, everything. So think about back in the day when you learned to write for the first time. And I know at my school, we had like a specific way that we were supposed to hold the pencil. And I guess I already had some weird convoluted way that I did it. And I'm not going to say that that is good to translate to an instrument because you should do everything the correct way. But I remember being so frustrated because I was already doing it my way, this like weird tense way that I held my pencil. 
and we had to learn this like proper technique way of writing with the pencil. And um, it was so difficult for me because I was used to this other way. But regardless of if you've been noodling around yourself on an instrument or you've never touched it at all, your hands and your body don't know the technique yet. So starting from the very beginning, it always feels like, oh, this is impossible. I'm never going to be able to do this. But that's where patience comes in because especially the first week or two on a new instrument, that's where the most growth happens with your muscle memory and getting used to technique. So if you have that patience to persevere for those first couple lessons or first couple attempts that feel so difficult, it will get exponentially easier after that point. But patience is really, really critical because if you get impatient, you're going to cut corners on technique or try to make it easier and you're just not going to help yourself and your progress that way. So be patient is definitely my number one tip um, because it will just really serve you as you continue to grow as a musician and as a player on your instrument. Um, okay, cool. Let's go on to tip number two. After be patient, tip number two is to be realistic. So this kind of goes in with what I was saying in the first tip about how oftentimes when we're attracted to an instrument or we want to play an instrument, it's because we're hearing professionals playing repertoire or pieces that we love and think are so amazing. And we think, oh, I love the swan. I want to be able to play the swan, you know, in six months. And you don't play the cello at all. And now the swan is a fairly advanced piece for the cello. So this is where being realistic comes in. There's no reason that you can't eventually learn an advanced piece, but there's a hierarchy and a structure to learning an instrument. And while everybody does, you know, kind of have their own pace at which they, you know, progress, for the most part, there's benchmarks that you have to reach in your technique and in the things that you learn to get to a certain point. So you can't really just skip steps and go right to playing the swan. I mean, you could attempt certain things like that, but you're really not doing a service to your overall technique and facility on the instrument because you need those intermittent, those intermittent steps to get you to that final goal and to build you into the cellist that can play a piece like the swan. So be realistic at least about your starting goals because any goal is attainable if you have enough time. So you can shoot as high as you want to, but just be realistic that things take time and anything rewarding takes work and discipline and also time. So just keeping that in mind, there's nothing wrong with it taking a little bit longer and requiring work. In fact, that's often what makes things so much more rewarding. So just be realistic when you're starting out on a new instrument like the cello, uh, that you will be able to reach your goals if you persevere, but just know those goals may take a little longer than you would like them to, and that's okay. Um, I think being realistic is what's going to set you up to be positive and be enjoying the process of learning a new instrument as opposed to setting really lofty goals and then just getting kind of discouraged early on. Okay, let's get onwards to tip number three. So tip three is be prepared to practice, or we could just shorten it to practice, but if you're taking lessons or you're learning an instrument, you probably know you're supposed to be practicing. But enough cannot be said about the importance of regular practice, even if you're getting weekly lessons or if you're checking out my course, which I'm going to talk about later. Muscle memory, as I said, is such a huge part of playing an instrument. And the time that you're getting instruction, be that from a video, from a teacher, from a lesson, is great because you're learning, but you're not really building up your muscle memory and your ability to continue to play these techniques during the time of the lesson. You need time after or in between lessons that you're putting in your own time to really get that muscle memory solid and really master these techniques. So practice is just an essential part of playing an instrument. So if you're ready to take on either private lessons or learning an instrument in one way or another, just know it's not only going to be the commitment of the time of the weekly lessons or when you're learning, it's also going to be a certain amount of time, ideally per day if you can, or at least a couple days a week, that you're setting aside to practice in a disciplined and structured way your new instrument that you're learning. So just know that practice is also going to really be sending you off into becoming a real player on this instrument. You need, of course, some instruction. You need to know what to do. But it's that time that you put in by yourself where you really work on things where the real change happens. 
you need the guidance of a teacher, but you're the one responsible for mastering these things and making them feel natural on your body. So you take that instruction and you take it with you every single day or as many days as you can to be practicing. So just know that practicing is not really optional, but practicing is a great thing. Who doesn't want to spend time alone with their instrument? It's awesome. Um, but just know that that's part of the commitment to learning an instrument is also setting aside the time to practice. You can't expect to have a lesson once a week and just get everything you need out of that lesson. Practice time is a huge part. Uh, okay, just checking in with you guys. Um, is there a specific way that you recommend people practice? So this, of course, um, you know, completely depends on your ability and what level you're at and what kind of repertoire you're working on and also how your teacher is guiding you because you should always listen to your teacher, you know, assuming you have a teacher that you trust. So, um, and I would hope you wouldn't study with someone that you don't trust. So let's assume you trust your teacher. So you're going to follow their guidance, of course. But um, I think what's great for practicing is having bare minimum for yourself. It's kind of like going to the gym or something. Like a lot of people say, like, if you just get the gym clothes on and get yourself there, then it's not so hard to do the workout. Um, so kind of setting those baby steps to make sure you stay motivated. Practice is very similar. So for myself, when I was preparing for recitals or concerts or recordings, I would try to always have a minimum, like if I was practicing six days a week as a professional, for example, um, I would say like, I want to make sure I get in at least 45 minutes, you know, for me today. That's of course at a more professional or setting to be professional level. If you're just playing kind of on the side, you know, we say amateur, not in a condescending way, just to mean a non-professional, you probably don't need to be doing 45 minutes a day necessarily almost every day of the week, but setting some minimum for yourself, maybe it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and maybe it's four days a week. Um, but just setting that first starting point so that you know that if nothing else, you meet your minimum requirement. And then you'll often find once you're practicing, you want to keep going or, you know, maybe you already did four days in the week, but you decide on the fifth day you want to practice again. You can always exceed that, but at least creating a bare minimum that you are going to meet will help kind of keep you on it and at least make you feel somewhat accomplished that if nothing else, you met your, you know, bare minimum goals for your practice for the week. And then I always like to work in some type of warm ups. You know, once you're at a point where you're playing actual pieces of music, I do think warm-ups and scales are super important, so always doing those at the beginning of your practice session before you get into the more complicated technical stuff. Spend that time, you know, I love to spend like 15 minutes on scales and warm-ups before I move to repertoire when I'm doing a real practice session. So of course, adjust that proportionally for your own length of practice, but get those warm-ups in first because the rest of your practice is going to be so much smoother if you spend that time just getting comfortable, finding your left hand tuning if you're a string player, whatever it is, um, your practice will usually be way more effective if you just make the time to do scales and warm-ups first. So many times I've just tried to leap into a practice session and play the hard stuff first and go after it and it's all difficult and exhausting and it's like if I had just played some scales beforehand it would probably have gone way smoother. So I do always recommend uh, that for practice sessions. Um, as a beginner, how long should I practice? So I would say usually beginners really only have like a stamina of 10 to 15 minutes. Like it depends on what the instrument, but assuming it's cello, like you probably can't, you know, keep holding your bow and left hand stuff for too long. Like you're probably getting fatigued pretty easily because it's still new. So especially when I'm doing beginner stuff and we're just doing like a basic D major scale or something really simple, Usually a student can go over everything we've done in a beginner lesson over the course of about 15 minutes, maybe 15, 20 minutes, depending on how much they need to work on each thing. So especially for beginners, you don't need to be practicing for long periods of time, but you should be practicing regularly. So it's like if you can only fit in 10 minutes, but you can do it every day, um, that's really going to help because, again, it's this muscle memory that we're really working on in the beginning. So putting that time in just on a regular basis, even if it's not a long period of time is going to really help your hands get used to the technique. Okay, so that was tip number three was be prepared to practice. Now tip four is develop your ear. So it's sometimes even hard to know if you're not musically inclined 
how well you do at identifying pitch with your ear. And I don't mean perfect pitch, which means if someone plays a note, you can say, that's a B. You don't need to be able to do that. Many professional musicians can't even do that but the ability to match pitch and to know if something is in tune. So like if someone were to play a B on the piano and then you go to play your B on the cello, would you be able to match to the sound of the piano? That's the kind of ear stuff I'm talking about. But there are a lot of ways that you can work on your ear. And one of the ways I like to suggest the most is just listening to classical music. So making a point to listen to recordings, and this is gonna help you beyond your ear being able to identify and hear pitch, but also it will help you to hear phrasing and understand musical structure. There's so much that we learn just by listening, even if we don't know the vocabulary to talk about it, even if we don't, you know, we couldn't say back to someone what we heard, just opening our ears and exposing ourselves to this music, classical music in this case, um, will really help us once we go back to our instrument. We'll have way more context for learning the instrument and understanding various techniques when we've just listened to a lot of professional recordings of this type of music. So I definitely recommend for developing your ear, listening to recordings, and something that's really great to do if you're listening maybe specifically to cello recordings because you're learning the cello. You can look for alternate recordings of the same piece of music. So if you really like the cello suites by Bach, for example, you can find a couple different cellists' recordings and listen to them and compare and notice to what they do differently and choose which one you like better. That kind of stuff is really just going to show you what's possible in the musical world. And as you continue to advance on the instrument, you're just going to have so much more context for understanding what you're doing. I've taught so many adult beginners or adult amateurs, you know, non-professional people playing the cello, and I have seen a dramatic difference um, in the, the students that do a lot of listening to classical music, how much quicker they understand things, how much better their ear can be pitch-wise, or, you know, they just have a better context, like I've said, for understanding all of these things. So it's a great way to sort of work on your classical music studies is just listening to classical music. It can be very passive, but just the act of listening will really help. Um, yeah, Randy says it's better to practice a little bit every day than try to cram a long practice session only one or two days a week. Totally agree. I mean, I do think once you're a professional, you can kind of get by with a lot of crazy stuff because you've paid all your dues from all your schooling and all the times that you've practiced. So professionals definitely start to procrastinate and cram a little bit, but we had to earn our stripes to be able to do that kind of procrastination. If you're still a student or still student level on your instrument, you definitely want to be playing more often, not cramming your practice sessions. Um, when you are learning a new piece, how far would you take it before you move to the next one? So if you have a teacher, of course, and you're playing a piece in lessons, your teacher's gonna decide when you're ready to graduate from a piece. Sometimes it's tied in with a performance, like a recital, or if you're like a high school student or something, there's usually like statewide auditions and juries or seating auditions. There's all sorts of things. Maybe you're learning a piece for that. And then once you have the thing or the concert, recital, whatever it is, then you're done with the piece because you've done your performance of it. So yeah, once you're a professional or on your own and you're just learning music, um, you kind of never really move on from a piece because you can always perform it again. You can decide like, okay, I think I've learned all I need to learn, but then if you're gonna play a concert with that piece six months later, you're probably gonna brush it off and have to practice it again. So, you know, you never really close the door on music because there's always a chance to play it again next time. So. For myself, um, I usually am goal oriented. So like the last time that I learned like larger bodies of new repertoire was when I was recording my albums, Bass Sounds and Bass Sounds Evolved. So those I sort of closed out with, of course, the recording of the album, but then I did CD release concerts. So once those, the album was recorded and done and I did the release concerts, then that repertoire was kind of finished for me. But of course, again, if I were to perform it again, and I have performed it since recording those albums, I always, practice it again. So you're never really done with a piece of music. It's just kind of added to your repertoire that you know. Um, okay, uh, do you know of any exercises that can be done to develop the ear? I've played viola for four years and I can tune by ear using harmonics, but I still struggle to tell whether I'm actually in tune. 
Well, harmonics are tricky for tuning string instruments also because if your string is old, your harmonic can go false. I actually don't love tuning with harmonics um, for that reason. Just there's so many strange things that can go on. I know it's convenient to tune with harmonics, um, but I actually find it a little bit sometimes tricky to identify for what you're describing. Um, in terms of pitch accuracy stuff, which is kind of what you're asking about, there's a lot of different ways you can train the ear, but for pitch accuracy specifically, one thing that helps is playing in unison or playing with drones, um, just having some sort of fixed pitch that you continuously play with so your ear can really zero in on that pitch and you're not kind of just grasping in the air for is that in tune, is that in tune, does that match, does that match, it's like have one absolute whether you're using a drone, I show this thing on my streams all the time. This is a metronome, but it does play drones and it has a volume control. So I have practiced like scales and even pieces by setting a drone on this and playing along with the drone. And that really helps me get in tune. Um, and this is on my Amazon shop, which is always linked in the description of the video. But you can use any drone or any, any fixed pitch to tune to. How often should I put rosin on the bow? Honestly, you have to monitor how much rosin dust is building up on your strings and be sure you're wiping it down with some sort of clean cloth that's been washed a lot, like something that will not leave lint on your strings, like old t-shirt that you've washed a ton. Be wiping it down regularly. I would say if you're not playing a ton, like if you're a beginner, you might only need to rosin once or twice a week. And just watch, if you're getting a lot of rosin dust built up on your strings and your instrument, you're probably over rosined. If you notice that you can play and there's almost no rosin dust on your instrument, then you probably need to rosin a little bit. So that's the easiest way to monitor. Okay, let's go to uh, the last tip already, tip number five, and then we will get into everything else. So tip five is find a teacher or a school or whatever that you trust. So learning an instrument, especially a classical instrument, is very technical, very involved, and really learning any instrument is. And who you're learning from makes a big difference because one, you want it to be someone that you know is experienced. Unfortunately, you know, teaching is a very good way to make money in music compared to performing, unfortunately. So people are eager to teach, but for example, I um, was once, I'm not gonna reveal any names or places, but I was teaching at a small community music school, private lessons, and they already had someone who was teaching cello, but it was actually like, I think a guitar teacher or something else. And I guess they kind of like also played cello. So they were teaching cello lessons and I had to sub for that teacher one day and went to teach uh, kind of like a middle school, almost high school aged kid who was taking lessons with this teacher. And they had fingerings written in, on their music that their teacher had written that were not act like, not appropriate cello fingerings like that nobody would teach on cello. So it's important to make sure that you're studying with someone who is experienced, who does know what they're doing, who's studied the instrument on a professional level and has experience teaching. And also just that you get along with a teacher or that you gel naturally with their teaching style. Everybody's different. You know, there's no perfect teacher for everyone. Every single person learns differently and also just has a different style that they like to learn. So finding a teacher that you trust, that you feel good about, is really going to make a huge difference in learning the instrument. So I would suggest, if you're looking for private lessons, for example, to try out trial lessons with multiple teachers. You know, if you're not sure, you find a lot of options, let the teacher know right away, I'm trying lessons with a few teachers. I've done lessons like this before for students and who tell me, I'm taking lessons from a couple people, I'm going to see who I like the best. Um, to be fair, by the end of the lesson, they always say, I definitely want to study with you, Emily, so go me. But that is definitely something that happens. And I don't expect everybody to choose me because, like I said, it's personal who you like to study with. But um, don't be afraid to try multiple teachers. And if you feel like you don't click with the teacher or you're not really learning or it feels incredibly difficult, like not even just what they're telling you is difficult, but like making sense of what they're telling you is difficult, that might not be the right teacher for you. So really uh, find a teacher or a person that you trust that's, you know, has some appropriate degrees and schooling in what you're learning. So you know that you're really learning from an expert. Um, of course, sometimes, you know, more fancy teachers are gonna cost more. I know that that teacher that I subbed for definitely had a much lower rate, 
but it's worth it to learn from somebody who really knows what they're doing. It's going to make a big difference in how you learn and what your progress is like. So just having a teacher that you trust, or if it's going through a community school or um, something like that, knowing just that you trust the school program and also, of course, the private teacher. Even if you trust the school, you want to make sure the private teacher you're getting is a good fit for you also. Um, really makes a big difference who you're learning from. So keep that in mind. So those five tips to review were be patient, number one. Number two, be realistic. Number three, be prepared to practice. Number four, develop your ear by listening to music, specifically classical music or music in the repertoire of what you're studying or hoping to play someday. And number five, find a teacher or a school that you trust. So I think those are all really important for starting out later in life. Like I've said, I've taught so many adult students, so I've really had a lot of time to think about these things and what a big difference they make. So if you're thinking about playing the cello or playing another instrument and you're an adult, I hope this all makes sense to you. Um, and I hope you find it helpful. So um, yes, and Randy also says, not all great performers are great teachers. That's big facts. And sometimes people who are not, um, a lot of times people who are not like the most prestigious performers are really incredible teachers. I would say for myself, if I'm being completely honest, that I am probably a better teacher than I am performer, just if we were to evaluate on just like skills, like how good are you at this thing? Um, I'm obviously a fine performer. I've done it professionally. I love performing and that's my passion and I was a performance major. But um, I have never won any competitions and I don't think I ever will or would have. Like I'm not like a competitive, high level competitive performer. Um, but I know many people who are, but they're not necessarily the greatest teachers. In fact, some of those super high level competitive performers are not good teachers at all because for them, they started super young typically. So when they were learning the fundamentals of the instrument, they were like five years old. So they don't even remember learning that stuff. They don't remember how their teacher taught it to them. It's just so ingrained to them from starting so young. And then even in their intermediate stages, you know, maybe they were 11. So it's like, they were not at an adult conscious age when they were learning some of this earlier stuff. So when it comes time to teach people at those levels, they're so removed from the struggles and the challenges of those earlier stages of playing because they were so long ago for them. Whereas for me, I didn't even start taking private lessons until I was 14, almost 15. So I actually started taking private lessons when I was already like getting near an adult brain, you know, I was a teenager. So I remember my first lessons and the types of things that I learned. And I remember the things that were hard for me and that I had trouble learning. So I think that's actually really helped me as a teacher because I'm just able to understand when I see a student struggling, I think, oh yeah, okay, I remember exactly that problem when I used to have that, here's what's gonna help. And so I think that's what's made me such a good teacher is actually the fact that I started my studies later in life. Um, not later in life like we're talking about now, I mean 14, 15 is not exactly later in life, but it is for the cello where many people start at five, six, seven years old. Um, any advice on reading tenor clef better? Um, I learned treble bass clef because of piano, but I was a kid. Um, yeah, tenor clef is always an adjustment. So that clef, for those who don't know, it looks like the viola clef, if you know what the viola clef looks like, which are called C clefs and they're movable. They can be placed in different places on the staff and that gives them a different name and a different function. So when it's viola and it's in the center of the staff, it's called alto clef, but when it's moved up two lines, it's now tenor clef, which is kind of like the advanced bass clef. It's the higher range of the bass. So the only instruments that really use tenor clef regularly are the high range of the cello, the high range of the bassoon. So it's for the upper, upper side of the low range instruments. And the nice trick about it on cello for tenor clef is of course that everything is one string higher. So if it looks like the notes are on the D string for tenor clef, those notes are actually on the A string. And then of course you don't have a string higher than the A string, but our first finger in fourth position, which is an E, I almost could do it on the cello, an E right there, um, that's like your next string up. So you can kind of use that as the string up trick. Um, but really, clef reading just takes time and practice like anything. So getting as many pieces as you can in tenor clef, especially simple pieces, like 
You can even work on like transcribing very simple tunes into tenor clef. It's just the amount of time you spend reading it. So other than the one, strict, one string over trick, which is kind of handy, uh, it's just a comfort thing. So if you're working on a lot of more difficult pieces in tenor clef, I definitely suggest either transposing or arranging, finding some way to put more simple things in tenor clef to practice your tenor clef reading. Um, okay. So now that we got through our five tips, if you tuned in late, you can watch the stream once it's over and go back. Um, so uh, we are gonna get to my announcement, but I do see one more question. You guys know I will always take your questions. Um, is online teaching making a difference in the way to transmit knowledge, mainly with beginners that have never taken in-person lessons? Um, yeah, so of course now, given the state of the world, many people are doing things online now more than ever, um, including taking lessons. I was already giving lessons over Skype, you know, when all of this happened. So I've taught online lessons for the last few years regardless. Um, you know, there's upsides and downsides. The upsides are, of course, that it's way more accessible to everybody. There's no more traveling. It doesn't matter where you live. If you live in a really remote city and there's not any good classical musicians around, it doesn't matter because now you can study from a great classical musician from anywhere. So the accessibility thing is huge, just making it way easier for people to actually be able to learn this music, especially people who didn't have access to it before. Um, the downside, of course, um, is sound quality is a big one. So like for instruments like string instruments where tone production is a big part of the more advanced study of the instrument, it is a little bit difficult to do that, you know, through a live stream technical setup because the quality, you know, does get affected so much. And, and something like a tone quality is something you really need to be in the acoustical space to evaluate. So for the more advanced things that can be a little bit difficult, though of course there's always other things to work on besides just tone production that can very effectively be done online. Um, and the other thing is for beginner beginners starting out, it can be a little bit difficult to go over basic setup and posture and stuff like that online when you can't be in person and see the person's body and help them orient. It's like a little hard to do that through the screen. But that's a big part of why I launched my new course, which is the big announcement of today. I have a few others, but that's the big one. So let's just get into my course because it ties, of course, into this, the topic of this live stream. So today I launched my How to Play Cello course. It is a five lesson course of video lessons available to anybody to teach anybody how to play the cello from nothing, including, which I know so many people ask about this, where to get a cello, Thankfully, there are now online rental places all over the United States. Um, my references, my resources are uh, US based just for instrument rentals. So anyone all over the world can take the course. But if you need recommendations for where to get an instrument, I only have recommendations uh, within the United States. But other than that, the course applies to anyone in the world who speaks English. And um, what I'm so happy about is I was able to do a full video, you know, doing the setup and the posture, showing multiple camera angles, troubleshooting the different end pen lengths, like going through everything in a really comprehensive way in the course, because it is such a difficult thing to try to do over live video with another person. So my course basically takes anyone with, you can have no musical background whatsoever. You can have a modest musical background. You could be a professional on another instrument. Any background is suitable to take this course on how to play cello. You don't even have to be able to read music. You're gonna learn a little bit in the course. And if you already read music, there's not a ton of time spent on it. So it won't be monotonous like, oh, I already know all this stuff. It's pretty brief, the music reading overview. I'm really focused on just playing the cello. So the course is really designed for anybody at home to just be able to learn to play. And it takes you through left hand technique, playing a full scale and also a piece, your bow hold and bowing, different types of bow strokes, reading notes on the staff. And basically once you complete all five lessons of the course, you get a directory of handpicked by me, private teachers who offer online lessons. So once you complete the course, if you're like, you know, I'm serious about this, I wanna take private lessons now, you've got a, resources, uh, a resource that has all of these different teachers on it. They're all people that I know who are amazing teachers. 
So I would have not put anyone on there that I didn't think was fantastic. So it's really great because I know for people who want to take, so many people are looking for something to do right now, right? Because so many of us are still at home or just life is different now and we would like, you know, more enriching activities to do at home. And I know a lot of people dream of playing the cello. So I wanted to make this as easy and as accessible as possible. But I found when I was thinking about this course and considering it, that there were so many barriers for people if they wanted to learn. One was figuring out how to get an instrument and what the whole deal is with that. So that's why in the intro video, I go over that, what you need to know about owning a cello or renting a cello, taking care of it, all that stuff is covered. Um, but then beyond that, it's like, so most people you have to take private lessons, but then if you've never played the cello before, it's kind of scary and intimidating to go get a private lesson when you have this thing that you don't even know how to use, you don't even know how to sit with it, you don't know how to hold the bow, and you're supposed to get on a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, Zoom call with someone and just figure it out. Like that's kind of a lot, I think, in the beginning. So the idea of the course is you can go at your own pace, you can pause the video, you can take your time. Every single lesson in the course also comes with a printout. So you can also just keep that for your own practice. You can follow along the printout during the lesson if you want, or you can just watch the lesson like you're watching, you know, you're having a real lesson in person. Um, but it basically gets you through your basic setup, your basic note reading, and gets you to a point where now, if you wanna go take private lessons, then you're in a great situation to do it and you should feel confident and like you know what you're doing as opposed to signing up for lessons and being like, oh God, I don't know, and then it's very slow in the beginning. I really think my course has tackled that issue and really set people up to be able to learn independently. And like I've said, I've taught tons of adult beginners. I've been teaching for over 15 years. I have taught so many private lessons, so I'm really confident that this is a great course uh, that's really understandable and digestible for anybody. I really wanted to make it that way, not too cerebral and difficult and slow, but like fun and easy and for anybody to understand. So um, the course is available on my website. That's what this link here is for. And what's also really cool about it, and another thing that I found that was prohibitive of private lessons is that they can be a little expensive. Now, they are worth the money because you're paying professionals who have very expensive degrees to give you one-on-one -on -one instruction. So private lessons are worth the cost, but when you're just starting out on an instrument, you might not really know like how serious you are and you already have to invest some money to even get the instrument. So it can be daunting to think you're gonna now have to pay a lot of money for private lessons on top of it when you're not even really sure exactly how serious you are. So my course is priced as cheap as I could make it. So it's about, I think, roughly half of what private lessons cost. Um, because every lesson, you can either buy the entire course, but if you want to take it a little bit at a time, you can buy each lesson in the course for just 25 bucks. It's, you'd be hard pressed to find a private lesson for $25. So I wanted to do that to make it even easier for people to kind of start out and get going. So there's five videos that are $25 each, or if you know you want to do the whole course, uh, which I really do suggest, there's kind of no point in just getting one video. It's just if you want to stagger out your spending and just only get one at a time you have that option but if you're going to take the course you should you know take the full course so if you buy the whole thing it's a hundred dollars for all five videos so it's like 25 dollars off it's like you're getting a lesson for free if you just buy the whole course so i definitely suggest that if that's if you know you want to do this course but if you're kind of just getting your feet wet you want to try it out you can buy each of the lessons just by themselves um so again that's all on my website but I'm really excited to launch it because like I said, I don't think anything like this exists yet for the cello. So kind of creating this new platform and new way for people to learn the cello is super exciting to me. Um, and oh, hey Herman and hey Winton too. Oh, you guys are so nice for stopping by. Uh, learn Baroque, don't go broke. Except this is just regular cello. This is not Baroque cello. This is just like standard regular cello for anybody. But I'm always down for the Baroque puns. We've already had a couple, and I'm down for them. So, um, okay. Um, Randy also suggests if you can afford it, it's worth having a decent microphone uh, for your online classes uh, rather than like a webcam mic or a computer mic. And I do agree. So like if you're taking online lessons with a teacher, 
You can get very inexpensive USB microphones. Like there's a lot of options for just very simple microphones that you can just plug right into your computer and then Zoom or Skype, you'll just go into the settings and choose your microphone instead of your built-in and you will get better audio quality that way. And I mean, your teacher will hear you better that way. So if you're taking regular online lessons, um, that is definitely a good idea to invest in some sort of basic microphone that isn't just what's built into your device. Um, Okay, cool. So I usually stream for an hour, but I was going to keep this pretty short today just to go over our little five tips that we did at the beginning, talk about my new course, um, definitely taking any questions on the course too if anyone, I know most people, it's pretty straightforward, and if you go to the website, which is also linked in the description of the video, if you want a live link, you can click on there's a whole outline of everything that happens in each lesson and what you're going to learn in each lesson. So if you're just kind of curious to dig in a little more on the course, just go over to my website. There's more info there. Um, and you'll also see, I did post here on my channel, a little trailer video talking about the course. And in that video, there's little clips of what the lessons look like. I'm here in my, this was my set for filming the lessons. So that's why I decided to do the live stream here. For those who watch my live streams regularly and know I usually have a different background, I came into this room where I filmed the course to have the course background for this. Um, the course is just modern cello. It's for beginners. So for most people, uh, even if they want to learn Baroque cello, you have to learn kind of just basic cello to start out. Um, so that's what the course is. I wanted something that could reach the most amount of people. So even though I do mostly Baroque and early music and period instrument stuff on this channel, and that was my professional specialty, when I decided that I was gonna make a course, I wanted it to be something extremely broad that could reach as many people as possible. So that's why I did it for modern cello, regular cello. Um, but if you wanna learn more about playing the Baroque style, there's tons of videos about that on my channel already that you can watch for free in the instructional videos playlist. That's another reason I didn't make the school about early music performance practice. I've already filmed a lot of lessons on that kind of stuff on my channel. So doing very basic beginner cello is something that I have not really done on this channel. I do have one video on how to hold the bow like a modern regular bow hold. Um, but other than that, I actually don't have basic modern cello lessons on this YouTube channel because my YouTube channel is more focused for early and Baroque music. So that's why if you want to learn regular old modern cello, regular cello, and maybe even transition to Baroque cello eventually, you'll want to check out my course and get started. Um, so I had this question actually, I think in my last live stream, is it better to start with modern and then switch? So um, you don't have to. You know, assuming that you have access to a Baroque teacher, it'd be amazing if you could start on a Baroque instrument. It depends on kind of what your goals are. If you know, like if you're an adult learner and you know that you want to play in the Baroque style on period instruments and that's your passion and you're doing this like as a hobby, like there's no reason you can't start on gut strings on a Baroque instrument if you have a teacher that, of course, plays on a Baroque instrument and is willing to teach you as a beginner beginner. Um, it's absolutely possible and a great point, I have a friend who studied Baroque violin very early on, like she started when she was younger in life and she said, it's ridiculous that people say you have to learn modern first because what do you think they did in the Baroque period? They learned the Baroque way first because that's all there was. So of course back in the day they were not learning modern first, this was how they learned to play instruments, they were learning on gut strings. Um, but now, of course, we have the option. I think if you're like maybe a teenager or something, or you, you're not sure where your cello journey is going to go, you should probably start on modern and just kind of leave your options open. And then you can always transition to Baroque after that. Um, so it really depends on the individual and what their goals are with the cello. Um, I'm not opposed to someone starting on Baroque, but of course, starting on modern is going to be a little more versatile. Um, Okay, so the other small announcement other than my school, which is definitely my biggest announcement and one of my biggest projects, so I'm really excited about it. And if you're checking out this live stream, I would love for you to go check out uh, the video about the school after this and uh, show it some support, give it a thumbs up or something. I'm really hoping a lot of people find it, you know, who are searching on YouTube for how to play the cello that they find my video of like, hey, I actually have a whole course rather than finding random five minute YouTube videos all over the place and trying to figure out how to play the cello based on five minute YouTube videos, you can just get this comprehensive course from an experienced teacher who will tell you exactly what you need to know. So 
yeah, if you show some love on the on the video for the school, that will just help it get around to more people. Um, so, uh, what is a good age for children to start on the cello? I mean, kids will start as young as three years old. That's how Yo-Yo Ma was three when he started. But I don't really like to teach kids until at least six, six or seven. And then it's still, you know, slow going in the beginning. But I do think six and seven year olds can learn. Also depends on the kid, you know, they have to be a kind of focused, um, focused child. If they're like a particularly kind of rambunctious, scatterbrained, not attentive kid, I don't think they should start that young. But I have taught six and seven year olds um, who are like serious, focused, love music, and like they're a joy to teach. So um, you can absolutely start around that age. It just depends on the kid. Um, okay. All right. So what I was saying, the other announcement is um, that I now have merch. I mean, it's not, I'm calling it merch, but it's not like Emily Plays Cello merch. It doesn't say like Emily Plays Cello on it. It's just, um, it's just merch that, hold on, I'm gonna make this noisy guy go away. You are going into timeout until you, okay. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to design some cool classical music themed stuff. And now Teespring, the site that I use to do all the designs, now has integration with YouTube. So you'll notice that under all my YouTube videos, my merch is now showing up, which is really cool. Um, so I started with some early music designs. I know they're more niche, like the early music community is not super large. Um, so I don't expect like those are gonna sell like crazy, but they were really fun to design. Like my favorite one says realizing things and it has a harpsichord. So meaning like realizing basso continuo, of course, very much in early music joke. Um, but there's also an I Heart Cello shirt, which I, I did a round of I Heart Cello shirts a couple years ago when I first moved to LA for fundraising. And people loved them. And it's just fun to have an I Heart something shirt. I mean, I'm from New York. So I Heart New York is like iconic to me. Um, so doing I Heart Cello is really fun. So now there's I Heart Cello shirts also, in addition to the early music designs, there's a cool shirt with a viola da gamba on it. Uh, what else is on there? That's most of them, but every single design that I did comes in multiple options. So it's like if you like the Gamba design or the I Heart Cello design, there's different kinds of t-shirts, there's sweatshirts, um, different kinds of sweatshirts too. Like there's just all sorts of stuff and then like a zillion colors and everything. Like I just wanted there to be like tons of options because I know for me, like when I'm buying clothes and stuff, I'm really picky and I want it to be the, my exact color that I like. So I wanted to give as many options as I could for all these styles. So definitely check out my merch if you're looking for like a cool classical music item or might make like a fun gift. Um, that's just right there underneath my vi all my videos. Um, I think the actual link is like teespring.com slash stores slash Emily Plays Cello. I should put that link in the description too. And I think you can click to it on the links down there. But yeah, so definitely check those out and I'm gonna keep making new designs. So if you have an idea of like, oh, I wish you had an I Heart Violin shirt or like, I wish you had a shirt that said like, oh yeah, there's another, there's a Baroque themed shirt with Bach on it too. Oh yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, so yeah, if you have just like a cool idea for a shirt that you would love to see or just something, you can also let me know because I'm gonna keep rolling out new designs and just sort of doing it for fun. Also, because there's not enough like cool classical music apparel. It's like a lot of it's kind of, like random or there's not like a good selection of like styles. So that was also why I wanted to make some cool classical music themed merch. So that's what it is. You can check that out and buying that does support me. Um, so you can also think of it as a way of supporting me getting some of my merch. So that is about it for today's live stream. Um, so thank you all who tuned in live and asked questions in the chat. Um, I have no idea how messed up the beginning of this live stream was because like I said, YouTube changed over their live streaming thing on their site. And so I had kind of a bumpy start to the live stream, but thank you for bearing with me. Um, I hope you found the tips helpful if you were watching this video for the five tips. Definitely check out my new how to play cello course. I'm so thrilled about it. I'm gonna be talking about it a lot. Um, new stuff coming on the channel too, like collaboration videos. If you want to be featured on my channel, like you play 
classical, specifically Baroque or early music, even better. But if you play classical music, you can apply to be featured on my YouTube channel. That's at emilyplayscello.com slash collaborators. Or you can just go over to my site, check out everything there is to offer. Go to the tutorials and see my cello school and my audio mixing tutorial. And then go over to collaborators and apply to be on my channel. And just go hang out on my website. There's lots of stuff for you there. Um, and I guess that is it for today. So thank you guys so much for watching. And I've been doing live streams, you know, I try to live stream once a month on the channel and then just put out other video content in between the live streams. So whether it's featuring other people, me playing with other people, videos of me teaching, talking, we got a lot of stuff here on this channel now. So if you're new here, be sure to subscribe, dig into some of my playlists. There's a lot there. So thanks guys. And I will see you next time. Bye.